Welcome to Cyrex Channel. I'm Anna Neymark, and tonight we're here with Petra Bless. You're the founder of Inside Outside, so you practice stretches from interiors to landscape, and recently very large landscapes. I'm curious how you bring different scales together. Quite often, we see that you flatten things into images, and those images begin to travel and map the different worlds onto each other. Could you speak about that? Yeah, it's, it's different for each uh, new commission, uh, how you go about it. Of course, I work in teams and we collaborate with uh, architects and engineers and artists and designers, but also within Inside Outside, we're a very multidisciplinary team. And I'm saying that because if you have a tiny garden, like a patio or a terrace almost, or a roof garden, and on the other hand, a kind of urban master plan, it's two completely different things, as everyone knows. But at the same time, the way we work is that you really imagine being in there and how you walk through it and how you experience either different rooms or different building blocks or perspectives. Uh, and so the work is always about the large scale. So the, the space, let's say the organization of space and how of course, together with architects, because we are not always the ones that do that, but imagining it or understanding it, and also bringing the scale always down to the detail. So how, as a human being, you would experience it, or what would you see, or what would you feel when you are there? And that's about sound, and it's about image, and it's about color, and it's even about scent, and. Uh, and climate. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about collaboration because it seems to be a primary mode of working for you both inside outside but also mm -hmm. outside right so mm -hmm. in a way you work with architects, engineers, landscape consultants. Yeah I think the collaborations are, are very exciting and always totally different but I have a real weak spot for the hands-on people mm -hmm. so it's always wonderful to to meet to find and to meet local not only professors or horticulturalists or textile specialists, but also the people who actually make it. So what we always try to organize is to go to the gardeners and to speak to the nurseries and to choose the plants and to see the roots and the pots and the, the condition of things that we plan to actually plant. And the same goes for the textiles or the printers. Mm -hmm. So not good enough to only speak to the in-between persons, but go there and stand or understand the profession of the person who needs to execute your ideas. Because if you don't, something goes wrong. Do you think about these curtains as objects or as backgrounds or as both? I think I'm thinking about the still frame video that you have on your website from the Venice Biennial project mm -hmm. in 2012, yep. where the curtains, they are participating in a kind of stage set and everybody comes on stage to actually look yep. at them and admire them in a way and walk around the different spaces that they construct. I'm interested in your read on your work. Is it meant to move to the background? Is it meant to really operate in the center on that stage? It depends yeah. totally on the context. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes it needs to be completely invisible. I worked with Sejima Nishizawa mm -hmm. on the glass pavilion mm -hmm. in Toledo years ago. And there you can imagine that it shouldn't be there at all. It has to be there technically and it has to do something. And we designed, you know, part of the design is also the whole track configuration. Yes. Because with the track, mm -hmm. you organize the whole movement of the thing, but you also organize the movement of the users or the public around it or with it or or whatever. Well, it's very theatrical when people take the curtain and really move around the stage with yeah, it exactly. or around their home. Yeah, so sometimes it is an object. It's yes. like a performing... It's a performance. Uh, it's, it's a personality almost. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's a totally invisible, mm. a neutral, non-designed, in other mm -hmm. words, uh, mm -hmm. thing that happens to be there. I'm curious if this metaphor of the theater and the stage curtain translates in 2018 to something that we can understand to be a kind of public space. Does theater and public space, can we bring those two together? Do you think about 
that juxtaposition? Yeah, we, we did both. As mm -hmm. Also, Venice is a good example if you would consider the Rietveld Pavilion, mm -hmm. the Dutch Pavilion, as a public space. Yeah. That this thing is moving through it yeah. as a kind of organic personality or animal almost. And it does something with the public. It either binds them together or right. all of a sudden it cuts through. So all of a sudden you're standing there by yourself by yourself with the yeah. thing in between you and the other. <laughs> and so that had a very active effect on the whole public space and the way people interacted. And in theater, it's, it's very uh, obedient in a way. It's right. really the stage curtain or the house curtain. And it divides the auditorium from the stage and it needs to perform in certain ways. And that's also yeah. a fascinating, I mean, you could concentrate your whole life on stage curtains because they move in different ways in different speeds you know we uh, made stage curtains that didn't go like this but actually went off stage like that <laughs> which is very funny because very funny. you hardly ever see it so in Lille Grand Palais I think in 94 or 6 I don't remember exactly this is what happened one curtain goes first and then the next follows and then you have uh, what we call guillotine uh, curtains, mm -hmm. they go up. So not folded like uh, Casa da Musica, but they just disappear into the stage tower. But you can also play with that. How quickly does it go up? And how quickly does it come down? And if you have that wind that you, you know, a curtain makes wind, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it moves the, the air around, uh, can you construct this curtain in such a way that you really see that, that it flutters or that it, that it billows or... So, I mean, even a stage curtain, although an obedient object, can have different personalities. Yeah. Where does ritual come in and come out? Where do you want to produce new ways of being in the world? Mm. And how do you understand the curtain to be a kind of participant and not only a kind of passive bystander in these relationships. Both really present. Huh? Mm -hmm. You have to choose all the time. You have to understand where you are and how things are conceived. So it's always beautiful or important to understand the traditional things and the cultural things uh, and then to do something with it that it makes it just a bit different, mm -hmm. you know, shift either the, even the position, mm -hmm. you know, traditionally the position would be X, but then you say, oh, but why not like that, physically mm -hmm. even, then it would changes the whole thing, the whole essence of a place or a mm -hmm. space. And then there is also this urge I have always, not anger, but a sort of fanaticism that I want to be independent. So all these things have to do with escape or mm -hmm. not really a boundary or not really closed or the illusion of eternal space where there is a wall. Uh, and so also escaping or emancipating the curtain, like why would it be attached to the architecture? Why can't it just float in space? Mm -hmm. So we made one curtain with balloons with helium inside, so the curtain is just kind of hovering, you know, and it's fantastic. But then if you open a door and the air becomes colder or warmer, whew, the whole curtain moves through the space, it goes from left to right all of a sudden, like, oh God, <laughs> so you can't control it anymore. Um, so the whole idea of emancipation is that for, for us also important. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because we're women, or, mm -hmm. or because I'm a woman, or, mm -hmm. but also just to experiment, like how can you make it mobile and entering a space, but also disappearing uh, without having all that, you know, physical necessities of yeah. structures and tracks and motors, although I love it. I mean, I love motors and radars and cables and, but, you also want to have it sometimes without. Where are you going next? How do you jump scales? And do you feel like that kind of freedom, emancipation, democracy, whatever you, can you find it also in the master plans and the work that grows 
to other proportions? It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. We're working on a master plan in the southeast of Amsterdam at the moment with uh, architects, uh, Kees Kahn, his name is, of Klaus and Kahn uh, architects. They mm -hmm. separated, so one of them is the master planning architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a developer and there's the municipality. And all these three, you know, make a plan, literally, where these blocks are and how high they are. And then there's this leftover space. Hmm. And that's the so-called landscape. And uh, it's a real puzzle how to liberate it a bit, you know, how it could enter into the ground floor, how it could move up, mm -hmm. become roof garden or terraces or... It's, it's very hard to stay free. You're always, of course, also imprisoned in program and in politics and e economy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's budgets and there's... Uh, and so the whole thing I, I try to also say to students is you should try not to see it as a frustrating prison, but you have to see it as a challenging puzzle. Mm -hmm. How with all these contradictory situations and requests and necessities, how you can still have your own handwriting in the end, your own, some of your own instinct still there. Petra, thank you so much for coming today. This was a real pleasure. For me too, thank you.